Rebecca, I'm so excited to see you again and have you on the show. It was such a pleasure to meet you uh, at Bridget Mayer's opening and the panel discussion and have a chance to not just hear you speak on the panel, but also on some one-on-one -on -one conversations about your work. So I've been really looking forward to this. I am so excited to be here as well. It was awesome to meet you. I, I love your work and um, I love your podcast and I'm excited to, to be on it. Thank you. Thank you. Yeah, this is, I feel like this has been in the works for a while because I've been following your work, um, following your research and your kind of adventures <laughs> that you've been having um, for a long time now. So being on that panel um, was just really great for me because it allowed me to understand a bit more about the process you undergo for your paintings, for your public works, um, and how important that element of, of research really is. So I can't wait to hear all about what you bring into the pieces you present. Um, so to start off, I just always love to hear a little bit of a background about you know what you were doing and where you're from that got you into the arts. Sure. Um... I'm actually originally from the Philadelphia area um, and it's a surprise that I'm still here now because I've definitely done a huge amount of traveling and relocating in my life, but um, ended up back where I'm from. Um, I always loved art and always from the time I was tiny, you know, had a pencil in my hand or something to be drawing with. And, um, you know, I, it was always a part of me and it was always just very natural for me. And it was a sort of a way I processed challenges and, and trauma and anything. Um, it was always through drawing. Um, and so I think I always wanted to be an artist. I didn't know that I could pursue that realistically until my father, um, Basically, when I was applying to college, you know, he, I, I did not come from a family of artists, you know, I have, I have artists in my sort of extended family, but my immediate family were not artists. And I, I didn't know, I didn't think that, um, that pursuing art would be something that would be something I could do. It just didn't dawn on me. And, and um, I, when I was applying to college, you know, I was about to put business down because that's what my older sister was doing and that's what my older brother was doing. And my dad sat me down. And he's like, Rebecca, what do you love to do? And I was like, well, I love art, you know? And he's like, well, that's what you should do. He's like, you gotta, you gotta follow your passion. You gotta do what you love. And he, that was just, that was the sort of permission I needed. The sort of, it opened up the door for me. And, um, you know, of course he wasn't saying that he would support me doing this. <laughs> <laughs> there was the emotional component, but no, I mean, he's like, you're going to have to find your way, but you got to do what you love. Life's short. And he was in the middle of transitioning from one career to another. And I think it just, it, it gave me that allowance to, to pursue it. And then I never looked back. So, um, you know, that uh, was really the beginning. And um, I went to school in upstate New York um, at Cornell University. And I always knew I wanted to do um like be in a university setting where I would be kind of taking other courses along with being a fine art major because I I think I had a sense very early on that I wanted to learn the skills um to 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 be a, an you know a, an accomplished draftsman but I also knew that I wanted to to take other courses you know I I knew that I didn't just want to be an accomplished illustrator I I I wanted to find my voice and finding my voice was through all the other courses I was taking and, and things that I'd be inspired by. And so um, I took a geology class when I was um, at Cornell and it, uh, for non-science majors, informally called rocks for jocks. And, <laughs> and this, and this one class literally changed my life. Um, you know, we would go to these state parks and, and see this exposed geology firsthand. It's a really beautiful part of the world, Ithaca, New York and um, learn about the, these processes that were happening. And it sort of set me on this, this path. Um, it really planted a seed for me. It wasn't until many years later, until after I finished grad school that I actually decided to think about um, this idea of incorporating geology into my paintings. But 
um, that was really where the seed was planted. And so I would say that's sort of my early start with um, becoming an artist and um, and becoming interested in science. I love that rocks for jocks is like, <laughs> oh, yeah. what a great nickname for that class. Oh I man. Know. Um, so you, you go on, you know, and you, you get your master's degree and you said it wasn't until much later that you began to bring that into your work. Was there a moment that you remember where you were like, wait a second, this is something I want to incorporate into my work or make my work about? I do. Um, you know, I, you know, went through grad school and was, um, creating, you know, very abstract, large scale paintings, um, I remember them being a little soupy, like they didn't have like a ton of structure to them. Yep. And I was really, you know, sort of inspired by, you know, abstract expressionism and sort of process-based painting and um, responsive mark making. And, um, but I, at the same time, felt like they needed to be grounded or anchored in some way. And I was trying to sort that out. Yeah. You know, at the same time, so this is after grad school, I'm in my late twenties and, um, you know, my twenties were, like most people, pretty tumultuous. <laughs> um, and I, I was in some like pretty bad relationships and um, sort of started thinking about, so, you know, one day I'm, I'm in my studio and uh, I'm leafing through an old textbook for my geology class, which, you know, that dates me right there because, you know, I actually had a book, but um, I'm looking at these plate tectonic diagrams that are um, essentially, you know, showing how, tectonic plates are separating and converging and um, colliding. And, and I started, all of a sudden, it started resonating for me as a metaphor um, for kind of interpersonal relationships and thinking about, you know, the, these forces underneath the surface that are causing upheaval above and thinking, you know, all the words that you, that you associate with it, erosion and collision and separation. And um, I just, I started thinking about relationships. And so in that moment, I was like, you know what, I'm going to incorporate some of these diagrams um, into my paintings and see what happens. And so that was really um, the beginning. And that was in 2000. Um, and from there, um, I started becoming really interested beyond the, the, the metaphor um, in sort of thinking about and learning about the geology of different um, places in the world. And so I started uh, applying and going on art residencies in places that I found to be geologically inspiring. And so I found myself in um, the Canadian Rockies at the Banff Art Center, um, learning about the you know formation of the Canadian Rockies. And then I um, went to Hawaii in 2005 and uh, did a residency um, exploring and trying to understand the you know process that forms the Hawaiian Islands, um, and I can tell you more about that if you want. But it was there that I kind of came across something really um, influential for the rest of my career. Um, at yes, I I want to hear all about it. Like okay. so in Hawaii at this residency, is it the National Park residency? I'm just curious. If no, it was. it was a little tiny place in um, in Naalehu, which is on the Big Island, mm -hmm. um, and it was just like a small artist colony called Red Cinder. I don't even know if it um, is still around. I think it is, um, but it was basically you know in the middle of nowhere. Had this little tiny kind of like outhouse type outbuilding for a studio, and but I was going and exploring the the volcano, the Kilauea volcano, in in every way that I could. Um, I'm, I think I'm really an adventurer at heart, and so I've sort of, you know, tied my work into, um, you know, creating these opportunities to to explore the world. Um, and so anyway, I was, you know, I was caving through lava tubes um, underground and I was in a helicopter above the crater and I was hiking, you know, near the crater. And <laughs> I, sorry, I sound a little crazy, but no, I mean, oh, it no, no, it's amazing. <laughs> okay. But but so I was there and I was, I was like, you know, learning about it and really fascinated by it and making these paintings, you know, there on site. Um, and then I came across this map um, in my research. It was a map of the ocean floor. It was a, it was a multi-beam sonar map. It's basically a map that's imaged through sound waves um, mm -hmm. of the ocean floor. And it there, I just 
saw on this map this incredible landscape that was hidden from view. Um, so here I've been looking at the islands themselves, which are just really the tip of the iceberg of these like massive seamounts, you know, and all of a sudden I was like, oh my gosh, there's this whole world underneath that's just hidden by the, by the water. And I, I want to explore that. And so, and that, that happened in 2005. And I've been on this sort of journey ever since with a couple of turns here and there, but, um, you know, I remember thinking, oh my gosh, I want to, I want to, I want to dive in a submersible. I want to go down to the bottom of the ocean and see this. And so I found out that there's only one, you know, submersible operating like submarine that's for, um, that that's owned by um, the U.S. The Navy and operated out of Woods Hole Oceanographic Institution. And Massachusetts. And so I called them up, you know, I was really excited. I was like, hi, you know, I'm an artist. And I, I, I want to know how does, how does an art, how does somebody go down in the submersible, you know, and they basically just hung up on me. <laughs> like, Who the hell are you? You know, with, with, you know, they were fully appropriate in doing that because I had no business calling them, you know, like the, this is like a two person submersible that's, you know, granted to scientists that are going down and doing research and you know I was just like this excited teenager or something you know but um anyway ultimately I tabled that that dream but um but found a way to go down later so okay so I have to go back to this because I love that you I mean okay to be an adventurer right you have to have a drive and confidence right to go into the unknown and not let fear stop you and I think that applies also in our um interactions with with people sometimes so you were like I'm gonna call them and I'm gonna ask so I I love that you did that so I have to so did that go anywhere eventually with them or were you like okay I'm gonna find a workaround like did it come back to them so well thank you and I appreciate that and I think it is a good sort of approach to you know I mean it's not that so much that I'm not fearless. It's that my desire to explore and and learn about the world supersedes that fear, you know. And um, you know, I'm actually sometimes shy, but um, in that moment, I really I was really driven to to want to go down in the submersible. Um, so you know, ultimately, through many other kinds of experiences, which I, I, I don't know if we have time for, um, I eventually found my way onto a research vessel. You know, all, up until this point, I had not been collaborating with scientists. I had just been sort of thinking about science, doing research on my own, but not really engaging with and collaborating with scientists. And so once um, that started happening um, in 2015, um, I was invited on a research vessel to go out and explore um, the ocean with scientists who were mapping the ocean floor. I wasn't going to be going down on the submersible, but I was going to be on the ship. And we actually sailed from the Galapagos Islands to San Diego for three weeks in 2015. And so it was there, my first experience going on a research vessel, um, working directly with scientists, we're getting this data. We were getting this, this live stream of data of the ocean floor, you know, coming up on our screens um, through sound waves um, and 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 basically like being the first person to see this this underworld underwater world, you know, because, you know, what many people might not know is that most of the ocean floor is not mapped. We don't know what it actually looks like in high resolution. Everything, if you go into Google Maps or Google Earth and you see like the ocean and you zoom in, all of that data is um, is is provided by satellites, and you can imagine the satellites are really far from from seeing the ocean floor, and so it's all very fuzzy. and um, And so there's only about now there's about twenty percent mapped, um, and that's only been in the last like five to ten years. Um, it's there's been this big drive in the scientific community to map more of the ocean floor. They're trying to get it all mapped by twenty thirty, but you know we'll see. Um, but anyway, so it was like this amazing kind of cutting edge technology, seeing the ocean floor being revealed and um, and making paintings about um, about that that hidden landscape. So um, I'm sorry I digressed. And now I don't even remember what your question was. No, no, but no, no. Are you kidding me? I love it. I love hearing this. 
Um, so I, I have a question. You said in 2015, it, so prior to that, you know, you had this interest, you're making work about it. You were going on residencies yourself and researching yourself. In 2015, there was a change where you started working with scientists. How did that happen? Was it through you reaching out to scientists? Was it you were just coupled with somebody? Um, but how did that type of research for you begin? I love that question. And I think you're going to love my answer. <laughs> Um, it began at a barbecue <laughs> with a couple of beers. Um, no, you know, actually, so I should mention in between my 2005 dream of going down an Alvin, I got, you know, married. I was, I, I had just been married and then I, I had two babies. And so um, my sort of jet setting was kind of tabled for a while um, while I had um, small babies and, and, you know, as they started growing up a little bit, um, they were still toddlers. I went in 2012 to Iceland and did a residency there. Um, and eventually, like around that time, a few, maybe a year after that, I, at my kid's preschool, I met a biologist. <laughs> I love it. I do. I, the way things work. Here's barbecue and at a preschool thing. Like, I, know, I exactly. it. So I had always dreamed, so I met this guy, um, Eric, who uh, is a biologist and, and runs the, the biology department at Temple University in Philadelphia. And um, his wife was like, oh, you have to meet my husband because everyone knew that I was, you know, my work was about sort of these hidden landscapes and that I was interested in this. Um, but, uh, and she said, you have to meet my husband. He's a biologist. He goes out to sea. So, you know, I met him and, and I was like, Hey, you know, we're drinking a beer. And I was like, you know, I've always dreamed of going down and Alvin, Alvin is the name of the submersible. And he was like, ah, yeah, who's this like, you know, <laughs> blonde, you know, chick, you know, wanting to go in Alvin. Like he kind of didn't take me seriously. And then I started talking to him about like multi-beam sonar and like bathymetry. And I was you know, starting to use some words and he was like, oh wait, she actually is like, she knows what she's talking about. And then I, he started looking at my work and he was like, oh, wow, like, okay, she's like legit, like this is like a, an authentic, genuine pursuit. And he's like, well, you know, you have to go out to sea first. You can't just like pop an Alvin, you know, like that's not like a thing, you know? And so um, it was through him that I eventually, he, he mentioned this program to me that I ended up going on, um, the ship called the Nautilus, which is I mentioned um, in the Galapagos went on that trip and then just started meeting scientists. And um, ultimately Eric invited me with him um, on one of one of the trips I went on. He invited me in 2018 to go out to sea off the coast of Costa Rica um, and go in the submersible with him. So I went in Alvin with Eric in 2018 um, and we are still um, very close and we're collaborating on a project right now actually. So, um, but but ultimately I started meeting more and more scientists and um, you know, it just became, um, it's it's a small world, um, the, the oceanographic community and um, I just became entrenched in it and it's been really life-changing, so. Oh. I love it. It started with a barbecue, beer, and kids running around doing their thing. And then you're on a submersible um, where they're mapping and <laughs> discovering all these uncharted spaces for your work. That is um, wonderful. I love it. Um, you also do deep sea diving. Is that something else you've done, like with scuba diving? So yeah, the diving that I was talking about was going down, like diving in the submersible. I have actually scuba dived as well. Um, I got certified in 2002, but I haven't done a ton of scuba diving, although I, you know, certainly love it. Um, yeah. Yeah. Well, being down on a submersible, I mean, also after everything that's been in like the news over the past year, you know, is um, just incredible to be down at those depths and being able to experience and see what is there. Um, I guess this kind of brings me to another part of your work. So, you know, research is such a big part of, of you and what you do and what you make. And you, of course, make these incredible paintings that I want to dive into, but you also make a lot of public works, um, you know, such as Convergence, which is on the AT&T building, and Ridge and Valley, which is a permanent installation at the Bauer Sculpture Park, among many others. Um, I'd love to hear how this kind of fits into what you were doing. When, when did that become part of your practice with the public art? Was that part of the research or came out of the research? Yeah, I, I really, I, 
I want to answer that. I just wanted to backtrack for one second and just tell you one thing about you when you were talking about sort of how impactful like kind of diving and seeing these spaces are. Um, and this ties into one of the public park projects that I've done. I can't overstate how transcendent it was to go down on a submersible. It's not, um, when you're going down a submersible to like into the deep sea, it's, it's not the same world. Obviously you're gonna see scuba diving where you can only go a certain depth. And so, you know, one of the things that happens as you're descending in, in the submersible, um, thousands of meters is you are seeing bioluminescent life all around you. And it is really, um, it's humbling and it's, um, it really changes the way you understand the natural world and sort of your part in it. And, and it's, it's a very, um, there's just a lot of humility in, in going down on that submersible. And in one of those trips, um, in seeing the bioluminescent life and, and the way organisms are communicating, um, I, I knew like, I'm keenly aware that that many people, most people are not gonna see this with their own eyes. And so um, I feel immense gratitude for, for the opportunity to do it and also a sense of responsibility to share it with other people and to sort of create a sense of connection with the natural world and with the oceans in the, you know, in the face of our climate crisis and in, in wanting to get people to really care about these spaces. Um, and so anyway, to then answer your question, um, it's funny because 2015 was was the first year I went out on a research vessel, and it was also the, the first year I did public art project, and um, it was kind of a an insane year. Um, and the, I, the the piece I did was actually on the um, on a at Temple University on a on a, on a large parking garage. I did this um, 40 by 70 foot uh, sculpture installation with light. Um, that um, was actually mimicking kind of sunsets and the way, um, you know, sort of sky tone variations over over long periods of time. And um, it was working with light sensors so that when, as soon as it became dusk, it would it would start to illuminate and then it would go through the night into, into the morning hours. Um, but, but after being down in Alvin um, in 2018, I ended up creating another piece called Shimmer um, that's at the Georgia Museum of Art. And that piece um, actually mimics bioluminescent communication in the deep sea. And it, it operates with motion sensors. It's an indoor piece. And as you walk by the piece, you sort of, um, you set off this disturbance in the piece and, and, and sort of see how um, these sort of trails of light happen, um, at, which are mimicking an, an organism that has all these long tentacles. It's called a siphonophore. And it sort of creates all these tentacles and trails of light at the same time to confuse predators. Um, and so I actually witnessed these organisms when, as I was descending in, in the submersible. Um, but you were asking, how did these projects come about or? Um... Yeah, and I think you've really started to answer it because, you know, um, I knew like the research was coming and then the public art was coming and I wasn't sure if they were tied together, but it almost sounds like um, it had to do with timing and also your experiences of what you were were seeing and experiencing and and sharing that experience with others. Yeah, I mean, I think um, I agree with that, and I think yeah, there was like a great timing thing that happened where, and again, it, and, and this kind of goes back to like sort of the drive that you're talking about because you know, I was doing this first public art project and it was a big project and I was working with a lot of different people, you know, to, to make this piece come about, which is something that I, that I, I actually think that collaboration with scientists and then doing the public artwork, they share this, this understanding that when you work with other people, you can really expand the scope of what you're doing. Um, and I think that's really critical when you're doing public art, because, you know, if you're going to do something on a really large scale, you have to bring in other people that that have the skill sets and the expertise to handle certain parts of it. So, you know, I'm not a lighting designer. I'm not, um, you know, a fabricator of, you know, large scale sculptures, but I can work with people that can realize my vision, you know, mm -hmm. um, and with, and with so working with scientists again, you know, it's such an amazing process of, um, it's really a back and forth type of collaboration. It's not just that I'm there to sort of depict what they're doing. It's really an emergent type of process where 
the whole is more than the sum of its parts and and I'm inspiring them and they're inspiring me and their line of research sometimes changes after they work with an artist. Mm -hmm. And of course, my work is greatly shifted because of, you know, kind of influenced by what they're doing. But um, what I was going to say about the drive part was that, you know, I'm looking at a picture if I'm looking in the distance because I'm looking at a picture of the piece I'm talking about. It was a very ambitious project, the thing at Temple. And I, it was sort of like, I had a lot on my plate. And at the same time, I was invited to go out to sea for the first time. And a part of me was like, I don't know if I can do all this. This is just a lot. I also have small kids, don't forget. Yeah. You know, so <laughs> I, you know, again, my husband, he's always right. He, um, I said, you know, I don't know if I, I can go out to sea now. I'm sort of, my work is going in different directions. I don't know. I'm not going to be going down in the submersible. I'm, it's going to be three weeks. That's a really big commitment, you know? And he was like, just go. You never know what might happen. You never know how it might impact you and, you know, take this opportunity. This is a really unique opportunity, you know? And of course he was right, you know? <laughs> um, and, you know, and then another time I went, I was invited to this workshop um, called the Ocean Memory Project. Um, which was a, like a five-day workshop. And this was also in 2017. Um, and it was more of like a, it was a collaboration with scientists. It was more of a, like a kind of a discussion, if you will. It wasn't like it, a residency that I was used to where I was bringing my paints and creating something and producing something. And I said, well, I don't know if I should go on this thing. You know, I'm not going to be making anything. And it's, it's a, like, I'm going to be gone from the kids. And my husband said, you're going to be making relationships. He's like, it's really important that you go. And I was like, he's right. Because I went and I met the most incredible people that I'm still working with now. One of whom invited me down in the research, in the, in the submersible Alvin. Um, and uh, so, yeah, I think like taking advantage of opportunities, especially unique opportunities, even when you think you may not have the bandwidth to do it is so important, you know, and it really can shape, shape your whole trajectory I mean these experiences have really changed my life as a like, they've changed the way I feel as a person and they've also you know immensely changed my my artistic practice and sort of what my work's about you know it's no longer about my own sort of solo practice in the studio it's really about it's resonating beyond the aesthetics of what I'm doing and 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 of course I still care about aesthetics um and and what the work looks like but it's 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 sort of taking it in, a, in another direction where I'm really getting people to want to connect with the natural world. And um, I have another piece that I'm working on that's actually potentially going to have like ecological positive impact, you know? So, um, well, I think it's incredible. And, you know, you're following what I think is interesting as I'm hearing about, you know, from the the rocks for jocks class now, like getting to see Rebecca's life is that you followed your intuition and work and it's led to these different opportunities. And now you have these like incredible public pieces that raise awareness um, and come out of your artistic voice, you know? So it's like checking all these boxes that I find just really inspiring. Um, and I also love that you have a partner who is so supportive of um, your career. And I think mostly like having children, young children, which I totally get, um, having a partner like that is, is so incredibly important for an artist who doesn't exactly have a nine to five, you know what I mean? Um, there are these opportunities that pop up that really can help us move in the direction we want to move, but we have to have somebody there who's willing to work with us. So I think that's really cool too. Yeah. And I know we, you know, we talked a little bit about this, you know, offline and I think it's really incredibly important to find a partner that, and when I say support, I don't mean financially support. You know, I, I make my own money. I, you know, I support my practice, but it's the emotional support and the, um, you know, the willingness to, to, to be really part of the parenting and, and like the domestic life that you have with, with someone, you know, because, you know, it's, it's really hard. It's hard to be, a, it's hard to be a woman artist. It's hard to be a mother um, and an artist. And I think that it's really easy to, to not 
you know, carve that time out for yourself because it gets really filled up very quickly uh, with everybody else's needs. And, um, you know, I just, having been in relationships that where I didn't have that support, um, it's, it can really be taxing um, on your career, you know? And so, yeah, if there's any young artists out there listening to this, I, you know, who's a woman, I think it's just, or a man, I, I think it's really important to find a partner that, that gets you, that gets that making art is a, is a valuable use of your time. Um, because it doesn't always feel that way. And it can be, you know, look, there's a lot of, there's a lot of rejection. There's a lot of things that I do where I'm not getting paid necessarily. Um, it's, it's, you have to really, you know, another, I'm sorry, I'm getting off topic again, but I just, I think a lot about advice that was given to me um, actually by Bridget uh, Mayor, my my gallery dealer and 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 longtime friend. Um, you know, being an artist is a marathon; it's not a sprint. And it's really true that, like, you know, sometimes it doesn't feel like an efficient way to spend your time. You know, it's it's really hard to make ends meet as an artist. You know, and it's taken me a long time to get to the point where I am really you know, a full-time artist supporting myself, paying for like a, a dream studio that I never thought I could have. And it's taken a long time to get to this point. It's not to say that I don't have rocky moments now because I still do. Um, it, it ebbs and flows, but I think that, um, you know, ultimately, um, yeah, I just lost my train of thought. <laughs> I was just going to say <laughs> <laughs> well, yeah. I was, you know, talking about like advice to younger artists and oh. that there is a lot um, that goes into the the marathon, the long game. I was thinking yeah. it was the long game, you know? And I just remembered it's about, it's about really being authentic to your own journey. And it's like every, you know, my, I'm authentic to what I'm doing. I'm, I'm, you know, I'm, following my passions. I'm doing work. I really feel like strongly about, and I'm, that's meaningful to me. And so I'm grateful for that. And it's not that it's always easy because it's not, um, I still feel like I need to really work and hustle. It never feels like it, it, it gets easier. I do get opportunities that come to me, but at the same time, I still have to really be, you know, having that ambition to keep it going. Um, but I think that like, if you're authentic, you know, in your, in your journey and you keep going and realizing that, you know, it's not going to happen overnight. It's, it's, I can't imagine doing anything else. You know, this is my, my passion, you know? So. I love it. I love it. And it kind of leads me into um, a question I have for you. Uh, I, have, I have a couple questions kind of in this realm, but one question I always love to ask artists who have really, you know, really held on and built their career at their work is that like is there any advice that you've learned or that you like to give people um in turn that that you've received uh that you'd like to share with the people listening i know we've kind of talked about about the long game and partners but is there anything else that you'd like to say to people listening that is a bit of advice that you've received hmm. um yeah, I mean, I think we sort of have covered the three things that I think are really important um, is that you're really, I think, going to find the most happiness in life if you follow your passions, you know, if you follow, if you do what you love. And and, and it might not be the easy thing, but it, it's the thing that's going to bring you the most joy and the most um, fulfillment. And so, again, my father kind of pushing me to do what I love was really super helpful realizing again that that you know if you want to be an artist you have to be yeah you, know, you have to kind of have a thick skin and i'm a really sensitive person and and but at the same time like going through grad school and and dealing with you know quote unquote criticism you know that isn't always constructive um you know <laughs> you know it's supposed to be and and just dealing with with the you know massive amounts of rejection you're going to get in the art world, you know, in applying for things in, you know, you're, you're going to get many more rejections than you are going to get, you know, yeah. acceptance. And so knowing that, and just, I think having the inner, the inner drive and the inner belief in what you do, um, and not letting your, um, your, 
sense of worth be um, defined by what other people think? You know, I mean, even on social media, it's like, you know, you could have people that maybe don't like what you're doing or, you know, have negative comments or whatever. I mean, I think that if you have an inner sense of, you know, belief in what you're doing, you can sort of ride through all of these, um, you know, all of these waves and, and challenges. You know, my mom also said to me once, she said, do what you love and what will, and what will enable you to have the lifestyle you want to have. And so that was sort of interesting because there is a reality of, you know, okay, I'm going to do what I love and I'm going to be a starving artist. And so, you know what, I don't want to be a starving artist. I don't, I don't want, that's not ultimately what I want. That's not like the ultimate sacrifice, you know, like, like I, what if I want to be an artist and I also want to have a house and I want to be able to like go on a vacation and, you know, this is real, real shit, you know, the, the sorry, I'm not, am I allowed to curse? I'm, totally. <laughs> so, I mean, you know, it's, you know, I, so I, when I was in grad school, I said, you know, I need to learn I need to have a skill. Like I can't just like make my art and and hope for the best, you know? And so I went to grad school so that I could have an M MFA and, and be able to teach at a college level if I chose. And also during my years of grad school, I ended up interning with a graphic design studio and learning how to do graph computer graphics and, and graphic design. And, and that was imminently helpful to me because ultimately when I got out of grad school, I was sort of juggling I was doing some, you know, adjunct teaching at the college level. Um, I was doing graphic design as a freelancer and I was doing my own studio practice. And over time, I ended up simplifying and, and just kind of pursuing the graphic design and my own studio practice because the graphic design was really lucrative mm -hmm. and it enabled me to have my studio practice, have a studio, mm -hmm. have an apartment, you know, and that's one of the reasons I'm in Philadelphia, by the way. A plug for Philadelphia is a really affordable place to live as an artist. And that's why I never moved anywhere else um, because it it actually enabled me to, to have the practice I have and to have the time to make my art and to have the space to make my art, you know? So, um, but anyway, you know, I did freelance graphic design for many years um, before I finally was at a point where I could really rely enough on my my art sale, which I always had, but um, I just didn't feel secure enough with the amount, you know, to be able to really make it work. And now since about 2016, I've been just making my art full time and it's been, you know, really gratifying, but it was hard fought and, you know, it's, it's, yeah. Thank you for sharing that because that's something that I think isn't discussed as much as it should be. Um, and one of the reasons I wanted to start this podcast, you know, I think some of the best advice I received getting out of grad school and it was over a beer, you know, not in a class or something was figure out a way to support yourself. Mm -hmm. um, you know, and it wasn't, you know, and I was hoping it was going to be this grand statement on painting and being an artist. I was moving to New York, you know, and it was like, you've got to figure out a way to support yourself. And they were like, there's lots of different ways people do it. You know, some people are gardeners, some people do graphic design, some people were doing web pages. You know, what find something that you can do that allows you to have the time and space to make, which is why I also love that you bring up Philly. I love Philadelphia. Like whenever I visit, also you guys have like the best radio stations. <laughs> It's like something I notice. Like I used to travel a lot. And I would show up in Philly, turn on the radio stations, and I'm like, this is the best out of every right. city, you know? Um, but finding an affordable situation is huge. I think of like Patty Smith talking about this. You know, she promoted Detroit um because of that. 100 percent So important. So yeah. important. It is, it's it is, and it's the truth. It's like find a way to support yourself, you know. And it's like, you know, also, you know, in grad school, I can remember like critics, you know, you wouldn't talk about selling your work. That was like, sort of like- Hands off. That's, you know, that wasn't a thing. And, and you know, it was just about the art and then the virtue of the art, which I totally respect. But at the same time, I'm like, I wanna make a living doing this. I actually want, I want to sell my work. And that doesn't mean I'm selling out, you know? It means that I'm making my work and, and, and sharing it with other people that want to enjoy it, you know? And so, you know, 
I think, yeah, I think there's some, it, it is, it's over the beer that, that you really get to the heart of it, which is you have to find a way to support yourself and um, find a place that's going to be affordable, you know? Yeah. yeah. I mean, to be totally honest, it's one of the reasons we left Boston was, you know, we had a family. Um, rental spaces are just being, you know, turned into luxury apartments. And um, I thought, all right, well, this is the time to do this and to think about it really seriously is how can I sustain my studio practice? What can we do here? And sometimes having to leave the quote unquote, you know, like leaving New York City or leaving a place like Boston where it's just not affordable really makes sense and serves you in the long run. And you have to, again, it goes back to that long game, thinking about not which is just going to serve you next month, um, but where you want to be in like 20, 50 years, you know, um, because you're still going to be making. So um, I think that's really wonderful advice. I, mean, I remember being, I remember being out of grad school um, and kept, and I was in Philadelphia because I, I went to grad school in Philly and I was like, okay, I'm going to move to New York. Like I got to go to New York. That's where I got to go. That's where I got to go. I kept applying. Like, so there was this foundation that provided you with a free studio in New York for a year. And I was like, all right, I'm going to get this and I'm going to go. And it didn't happen. And I kept thinking I was going to go. And then I realized, wait a second. It's like, here I am, I have a studio and an apartment and I'm and I'm able to do this. If I move to New York, I'm gonna have a shoebox. I'm gonna be working three jobs. I'm never gonna have time to paint. What's the point? You know, I like I can live here and be an artist, you know? And and actually I love the art community here and I'm close to New York. I can visit whenever I want. So Yeah. You know, it's kind of like you have all the great things right there. And I keep meeting more and more artists from Philly. Like, I feel like everyone I know is either from Philly or connected to Philly. You know what I mean? Like, which is amazing. Um, I thought so one I, other piece of advice, I'm sorry. I was just thinking as you were right. talking about the, the guy with the beer talking about that, about exactly. like sort of like, this is like, this is the nuts and bolts. The other thing that, that people don't, maybe don't realize or don't think about is that like, you know, you can't just make your art when, inspiration you know comes to you or like the creative juices are you know yes that would be nice but like it's a job and I and I don't mean to like make it sound unceremonious like I love I love what I do but it is a job and I have to be really committed to that job you know I was talking to someone who writes for Netflix and they were like I can't just write when I'm you know the feeling strikes he's like I have to spend eight hours a day writing whether or not I'm feeling it or not and it's like you have to push through like the, the difficult moments, the moments when you're not feeling what you're doing and, and kind of work through it because, you know, it's in the end, like you have to have that rigor, I think, if you want to really see results. Yeah, I was having this conversation with somebody, which is, you know, artists, we have to be self-motivated and not everybody is built to work at home or alone or in a studio, you know what I mean? And keep that structure because you have to create your structure and rhythm. And I get asked a lot, you know, like, Erica, how do you juggle all these things? And it's, it's really, I, I just think of it as a job. And so I do all the things that somebody who works does to create the space, you know what I mean? Um, and there's sacrifice in that, but it's like, you have to create a rhythm for yourself and not just, I don't know, kind of floating in a space where you're waiting for something else external to do something to you. You have to initiate and make, you know what I mean? So I think that's really good 100% advice. I agree with that. And it's so true. Like, it's like that rigor. It's like, it's discipline. It's really discipline. You know, it's like, you know, you, you were asking me, you know, one of the questions you had that I saw before was that, you know, what's, what's a day in the studio look like, you know? And it's like, you know, I, I have to do some business, you know, I have to take care of emails and, 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 you know, just follow up with certain things or opportunities. And then, and then it's like, I have to get to work and, and I don't have, you know, I have kids. I don't have the freedom to just stay here until 10 o'clock at night and, and paint till I, you know, I'm like, I got to get my kids to, flyer and like do this and do that and dinner and you know it's like there's a lot of juggling but so I think it really comes down to discipline and yes that that internal that internal motivation you have to you have to really want it you have to be motivated to do it nobody's going to tell you 
you know, I, I remember getting out of grad school. I remember being in grad school and, and having this wonderful community, this camaraderie of people that were looking at your work. You'd have all these critics come to your studio and everybody's like rooting for you, you know, to like create your work. You step out the door after grad school and nobody cares if you make another painting again. Nobody could, nobody cares. Like you have to care. You have to want it. You have to want it. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. I have to ask you another question, actually, because you're mentioning it and it's um it's very self-motivated for me. <laughs> but you know, you have had the toddlers and they're a little bit older now and doing their things. Um, do you have any advice to women artists who are, you know, they're doing it, they're making it, they're trying to do all the things, and they've got young kids? Like, do you have any advice? to people basically like me who have like a (laughs) three-year-old and has studio practice and business things going on. Like what, I would love advice from you, Rebecca, in terms of being an artist and a mother. But it sounds like you are doing it. It sounds like you're crushing it. And I don't know that you need my advice. I mean, I think it's really hard. And I think that um, I, you know, there's times I feel immense guilt, you know, when I'm, when I have to leave to, to, to go on a trip, I feel tremendous guilt about leaving my kids and and you know and I think what I've learned is 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 that it's not just the like the parenting you're doing but it's but but it's showing your kids it's being a good example for your kids that you're pursuing your passions and so they'll see that and they recognize that and then they'll respect that you know it's like you know, I, I worry about, oh my God, if I miss this, then I'm, I'm going to feel so bad. And, you know, there's certain things like I won't travel, you know, like I had an opportunity to go out to sea and it was, I said, I'm not leaving during these times because my son's birthday's here. And this is that, you know, I'm like, I forget it. Like, I'm no way, but like my husband has said to me a million times, like the kids see you doing what you're doing and it inspires them, you know? And so it's like, it's not just the act, the physical act of being in the room with them and parenting them. But it's, I think, being a role model for them and being an inspiration for them. So I think trust that you're a good parent, because I know you are, I can tell, you know, and that like, you know, I I mean, I'm trying to think of of the advice that you, I mean, I think finding good help, you know, is, is important. Finding people that you trust to sort of take care of your kids when you're not there, you know, Mm -hmm. um, and, uh, you know, I'm trying to think. Well, I have to say that what you just said there about the, the guilt, I think that is the biggest thing I'm struggling with. Cause I figured out a way to do the things that I do, you know, and to organize it and make it happen. And, but the guilt now that is what's really been popping up where, you know, um, I can't make it to basketball practice or, you know, I'm going to have to travel for this art show. Um, going up to Chautauqua, that's going to take time away. And navigating that while staying like healthy, you know what I mean? Mentally and emotionally, because I think it's really easy. I'm discovering to have that guilt and it comes from, you, you know, I think it's, um, pumped to us in a lot of different ways and online, et cetera. But that's the, that's the puzzle piece right now that I feel like I'm personally struggling with as an artist mother is is so hard. And I won't lie the guilt. So I will tell you the guilt doesn't go away for me anyway, but um, I realize that I also, you know, I think as a woman and a mother, you know, even though we're in 2023, I feel like I, okay, I have, you know, I'm the mother and I need to be there. But the reality is, is that you know, a lot of men travel for work all the time and it's not even a consideration, you know? And so I trust that what I'm doing is valuable and they see it as valuable too. They get it. And so I think, and I, and I do think in some ways it's harder now traveling as they're te- my kids are teenagers now. They're my, actually it's my son's birthday today. He's 15. Oh, happy birthday. <laughs> I'm 15 and a 17 year old I can't believe wow. it I don't feel like I'm older than 16 but <laughs> mentally okay. anyway um but um I think when they're younger it's like they don't they don't quite miss you in the same way they don't need you in the same way they need you but it's more like 
for you to be physically there. Now I feel like my kids need me when they need me. It's like, they need me emotionally. They can yeah. get the clothes dressed. They can, you know, yeah. look, they can, they can, my son's driving. He can drive himself. Like he doesn't need me to do any of those things for him. Yeah. But what he needs is sometimes when he needs me emotionally, he needs me. And so I just, I try to be available, you know, even if I'm on a research vessel, I can talk on the phone, you know? Yeah. And so um, I think, but I think it's, it, they're going to be okay. And it, it's good for them to learn also that they can be okay without you. And that's what a lot of people have said to me, like, you're not going to always be there, you know, and it's good for them to learn to be self-sufficient too, you know? And I, I think it's obvious. I can tell just by knowing you for five minutes that you're incredibly present with them when you're with them. I and am. So, I really, really try. So thank you. <laughs> and, I think, and I can say the same for myself. Like I, you I know, I think you. if you're really motivated in what you're doing and driven, you're going to be driven to be the best parent you can be too. And so, you know, you're going to be present in those moments that you're with them. And so I would just like, trust that like they're going to be okay when you're not there and they they always know that you're there that yeah. they, they love them you know yeah so. oh that was such good advice thank you Rebecca I'm sure there's artist mothers listening who are also struggling with the the part of guilt you know and doing what we do but also maybe recognizing that that guilt may always be there but that it shouldn't hinder you from do taking taking the trips that you need to take, always being present with your kids when you're there, all of the things that you mentioned, which I think is wonderful. Um, I'm going to switch it a little bit to uh, a question that I got specifically for you in the works membership. So I, I shared with our members that I was going to be talking to you and people were very excited. They knew your work and um, loved what you were creating. And we had an artist, Nicole, who asked, um, she's interested in getting into public works more. And so um, she asked, where is the question? Oh, what recommendations do you have for someone earlier in their career who wants to apply or become involved with public sculptural work? Yeah, I mean, I think that um, there's a couple of things that you can do. You know, for one thing, I think, Sorry, I'm not answering this question very well. No, 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 no. Go ahead. Go ahead. No. Get that part out. Um, so I think it's tricky in the public art world because it's like that old adage, you know, which came first, the chicken or the egg. It's like you need to have some works in order mm -hmm. to have somebody be interested in your work. But it's like, how do you get the first project? You know, and I'm trying to remember, you know, I with my first mural project, I applied actually I was shortlisted for a call in Philadelphia but I've applied to a lot of projects like that um I think there are opportunities out there where you don't necessarily have to have a, a portfolio of public work like you could show some ideas maybe you have some concepts you want to create and you can show some of your small scale work um, mm -hmm. And so I think like the most important thing is to look for opportunities. You know, there's of course call for entry, which is one of the big online um, platforms that have, um, you know, artists, public artist calls. And a lot mm -hmm. of them, there are some that, ha that are for people. They say, you don't have to have experience. This could be your first time, you know, we're open to emerging artists. And so I think maybe um, the best thing might be to, you know, if you have smaller scale work to be able to share that in your portfolio of, of something that you might want to scale up. Um, I think, uh, you know, maybe following, um, I'm trying to think, you know, this again, I already had a piece to show, but I actually on Instagram, um, you know, was found on Instagram through um, the city of Alexandria for a piece. Um, um, and that was a surprise to me because I didn't think that, you um, that they would be looking at my, you know, that they would find me on Instagram. I, you know, I'm not someone that like sells little paintings on Instagram. I'm more, you know, like my work is sort of usually through a gallery. And so, but they actually, I asked them, I said, how did you find my work? And they said, Instagram. And I had, you know, of course the, the hashtag public art, but I think if you have maybe concepts for, for public works and maybe you could post those and then post, I mean, it's hard. It's really hard. I think ultimately, you know, trying to think of how to answer this, this yeah is a, this it's a a, I, I think 
I think, I think seeking out opportunities, you know, looking, applying to things that, that are specifically for artists that don't have huge portfolios yet, you know, and I guess my follow-up question would, for that would be for somebody who does have a robust portfolio and is looking to dive into public works, would you have any advice for them on, on taking that leap? Yeah, I mean, again, I think it's about um, really paying attention. There are so many calls for public art all so the time, mm -hmm. and they're open. You know, they're they're you know national competitions. Like I, I have seen so many calls for public art on call for entry, yeah. uh, and so I think that that's one one thing to do. Another thing to do is, um, and I think on call for entry, you can even set up like a portfolio that people can look at, um, sort of like a, not an archive, but I'm forgetting the term for it, but you can just sort of have your work there for people to see, you know, um, and that, and it's free, I think, to do yeah. that, you know, cool. so if you have a portfolio, you can do that. Um, you know, every city, every city has a call for public art program, you know, has a public art program, and um, you can start looking at regional opportunities that might be easier to get at first if you're emerging in this field. I know a lot. I mean, I, I, I know a lot of, for instance, mural projects. They, they said, you don't have to have any experience. Show us your work, you mm -hmm. know. Um, so show us your regular studio work and maybe, you know. Yeah. You can, so I think that yeah. is really good input right there, you know, because I'm thinking of, um, a lot of painters I know who were far into their career, who were applying to these types of projects. Like it wasn't that it was always presented to them, rather it was them applying to these, um, these calls, you know, for public works. And then once they got that, they were put in contact with um, people would, who would help them realize that call. And it seemed like a lot of times after they got one under their belt, and I think this is true with kind of anything that we do. Once you get one thing under your belt, you know, you, you know the people, you meet the people and more things kind of come to you in that realm um, from from what I've seen, you know what I mean? I think it it does help once you get some stuff, you know, under your belt and in your portfolio, it does really help. And, you know, so I work with a gallery for my public art projects, like like my my dealer, my manager, Bridget Mayer. But, you know, sometimes there's projects that... Um, aren't necessarily paying what I would like them to pay, but we sort of, it's sort of like a cost benefit analysis. Like, okay, this is going to be really good for the portfolio. This might lead to other projects, you know? And so even though maybe I, I want to be making more money on this project, this is going to lead to other things. And so I'm willing to sort of, you know, to, 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 to go along with this, you know? Um, you know, the other thing you can do is there's a lot of art consultants. There's a lot of like, you know, art consultant websites, you know, if you start searching, you can just send an email with a PDF of your portfolio and say, Hey, you know, I'm, you know, I'm looking at your program and I think that, that my work might be of interest to you and, you know, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And send them your work as a PDF, you know, not just like your link to your website, but actually send an attachment, you know, or even be old school and send a physical, you know folder with prints, which I've done before. Um, I love it. I love a print though. <laughs> I'm old school. <laughs> well, it's nice. It kind of shows like, it shows like, you know, you're making an effort, you know, so many guys, like, it's so easy to just email a gallery with your website, like, Hey, check out my work, you know? And it's like, <laughs> you actually went to the process of like putting together a printed portfolio and mailing it to somebody, they're going to open it. Yeah, they're taking the taking the steps and showing the initiative. No, I think those are all really wonderful suggestions, Rebecca. And um, I, and, I think, and, I, and I'll add that I agree with you that um, I do ha now have opportunities. To sort of, you know, somebody approaches me about doing a public art project. I'm doing one in Boston this summer. Um, you know, yeah, but 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 at the same time, I still do look for these public calls, and you know, I just recently applied for an outdoor public art project in Boulder. And I was a, a finalist and I ended up not getting the project. And it was, you know, a lot of work that led to nothing. But at the same time, it helped me perfect, you know, some ideas and think through some things. And, you know, you always have to see the silver linings in, you know, in, in these efforts because, you know, maybe it, it sparks, 
you know, an idea for another project, or, you know, maybe you figured out some good vendors to work with for the public project, or, you know, maybe you made a connection with somebody and, and they're going to contact you later about something else, you know? So, um, it is a lot of work and, and I think it is easier as time goes on to get things that come to me versus me always having to hustle. Yeah. No, I think that's such, such wonderful advice. It's making those contacts, it's building the work, you know, and, um, again, I think it goes back to something you said earlier, which is you can't wait for things to come to you all the time. We've got to like make the studio time. You got to get in there. You know, you have to put together the portfolio. You've got to do all the things. Um, Rebecca, this has just been such a wonderful time talking to you about your work. I just want to thank you for taking the time out of your studio day to be here to share your experiences, your work, and um, your advice with us today. Thank you so much. This was wonderful. I, I feel bad I didn't even talk about actually my my the process of my painting, but I know. But it's too much to talk about. I know you you do a lot. You do so much. And hearing about how you're incorporating your experiences into your life as an artist, I feel like is just incredibly important for people to hear. Um, so I love that we've we've been able to do that. And we can do another podcast sometime where we just do your paintings. <laughs> It's such a pleasure to talk with you. I really appreciated your your questions and and your thoughtfulness and 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 I'm excited to see what you do and with your kids and you know just don't don't worry about it. It's all gonna be it's all gonna work out great. Mom <laughs> guilt. It's a real thing. Um, Going on the field. <laughs> <know. laughs> well, at least we could all talk about it now together. You know what I mean. So. <laughs> Well, um, again, Rebecca, thank you so much. And can you share with everybody listening where we can find your work online, um, like Instagram, website, and all that good stuff? Oh, sure. Um, my Instagram is just Rebecca.Rutstein. That's R-U-T-S-T-E-I-N. And my website is RebeccaRutstein.com. Um, I'm also on LinkedIn, but that's not really... It's... <laughs> I love it. I love it. I'm on uh, TikTok, but I barely, so. Yeah, yeah. Uh, well, we'll be sharing uh, Rebecca's work over on our Instagram at I Like Your Work Podcast, so you can follow along there, find her tagged, um, and of course, find her website and more information on Rebecca in the show notes. So um, again, thank you, Rebecca, for being here, and I hope you have a really wonderful day. Thank you. You too. Bye. Bye.